All right. Welcome, everybody. So a little story. When we were first, we had the session that we were thinking about, what do we want to do? And we had some options, and a lot of them, frankly, sounded boring. And so we decided to talk about something that we think is actually a, a present and pressing issue. Uh, and this is about what we mean by what we mean by having OpenStack being a being in Python. Now let me take it for a second and set the set the stage. When Py when OpenStack first started, both uh, the NASA folks at, at ANSO at ANSO and, and Rackspace were Python shops. It was a natural fit, and there was a conscious decision to say we are doing this in Python for a couple of reasons. The first was to, to maximize developer productivity. We know that Python has and can scale to very large sizes. For example, all the things that we've seen in, in the keynotes are, by and large, pure Python. Uh, they are scaling pretty large, pretty fast. We also know that it makes it really easy to, for people to get in and understand the code and if you're doing something that's relatively complex, that can be a real benefit. The third thing is that there was this idea that we want to make sure that we have reuse of components that are out in the community and components between different OpenStack pieces. But time has moved on. It is now no longer 2010. We're five years down the road. And we think that the time has come to start looking at this question and thinking about it a little bit more deliberately. I would start out by saying that I don't think that OpenStack as is is necessarily a pure Python project because we have services that are written in Erlang. We have components that, are, that we write that have sub substantial portions of JavaScript in Horizon, for example. We rely on several C or C++-based programs to, to provide services. So the question is, if you are on the other side of a particular uh, on a particular network connection, does it really matter what the other side is written in? On the other hand, it all, there's also a real sense that we want to limit the spread of the number of stacks that we need to support. Every time we need to deploy a new type of thing, that's a new DevOps burden that makes running and managing and patching OpenStack that much, hard, much harder. So. This is not necessarily something where we have come and said, we have a definite point of view here, other than to say, we realize that there's an idea of we want to choose the right tool for the job. And the right tool for the job is frequently Python. But the question is, is it always Python? So we've brought together people who have had experience implementing, working with, or doing OpenStack services in things that are not C Python 2. And so I'll hand the time over to each of these gentlemen. They'll spend a couple minutes telling about their experience and what alternative implementation uh, language experience that they've had and what they've seen as the benefits and what they've seen as the drawbacks. At that point, we'll start to have a little conversation, which will start out among us. But very quickly, we'll op we will open up also to everyone here in the audience. We think that this is a community issue and one, that we're, one where we want to start the conversation. Uh, when we do start, the, uh, start to have questions, please come up to the mic right here so that, you can, uh, so that everyone can hear you and you are heard on the video as well. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Scott. Can you introduce yourself? And Hi, my name is Scott Simpson. Um, I'm a director of engineering for uh, Rackspace's cloud storage, which includes cloud files and cloud box storage. Um, I manage uh, both those teams, the, most of the original Swift um, developers are on, on my Cloud Files team. So um, we've, we're, running, uh, we're running Cloud Files um, pretty big at this point. I think we probably have one of the, the larger Swift implementations. Um, I'll give some more numbers during the Hummingbird talk. But the team uh, has been working on a program or a project called uh, Hummingbird, which is to re-implement portions of Swift in Go to um, deal with some of what they would think are some shortcomings of Pythons when it comes to disk I.O. So um, that's what we've done. Um, the team's generally not a ooh shiny kind of uh, 
ADD thing where they jump around between all these new things. So um, for them to sort of switch to Go is actually a big deal. Um, they're all very dedicated Python people. So. so could you share just for a second, what are some of the, what is some, some of the differences that you've seen? Um, so uh, I've got a lot of these numbers in my presentation later on on Thursday, but. Um, share them twice. Yeah, just our, um, our basic performance numbers on, like, say, gets to the object server, um, we've seen a 10 to 11 to 1 X improvement. Um, basically going from about what we can do, about 1,500 requests per second to about 10,000 to 11,000 requests per second. And that's just on gets. Um, puts and posts, we can see an improvement of four to five to one. So it's a, it's a huge improvement, and that was just a direct port. That was literally, you know, copying the functions over into Go. So, um, you know, we'll talk about this later, but the, we just implemented sort of the base. We don't have, um, we don't have uh, storage policies implemented yet. And the object server is kind of dumb, so that's kind of where we started. It's just basic CRUD stuff for now. Um, the other thing we implemented was the replicator. And we've seen some dramatic improvements on being able to improve replication speeds. So. Excellent. Brian? I'm Brian Curtin. I work in our developer experience team at Rexbase. And so my kind of niche area is less on the server side and more on building clients and, and libraries and stuff like that. Um, and that's an area that, for, for my part of this talk, is about Python 3. Um, and that's mostly a solved problem. A lot of the client stuff is already there. Um, the things we're building today are, are Python 3 first. They happen to work on 2 and 3 at the same time. But um, on the server side and on the, on the product side, um, because everything is currently in Python 2, it's at some point eventually going to have to be Python 3 or something these gentlemen are talking about. Uh, mine is the little. Uh, the less controversial of the, of the topics here, uh, given that Python is just Python and you can just port stuff. It's obviously a significant effort. Um, there are a number of things underway um, in terms of Python 3 within OpenStack on the, on the server side. Um, I saw Victor Stinner. Oh, there he is. Um, I feel like Python 3, he's a good guy to know. Um, working for Red Hat, and there's, you know, um, exploring a couple things with porting Nova to, to Python 3 and then going through a lot of the um, uh, the tasks that will have to happen to port other things. So um, with, with Python 2, so we're currently at Python 2.7, 2.7.10, uh, I believe is just in alpha 1 or alpha 2. Um, and we're, we're coming on the end of uh, support from the Python developers. So I'm a, I'm a core Python developer. I'm on the board of directors of the Python Software Foundation. So I kind of have two seats here that I'm a Rackspace person, but I'm also a Python person. And we don't support Python 2 anymore. So we, OpenStack is built on a dead technology um, that is going to rapidly you know, go away. All the focus is on three. All the features are on three. Um, we could do a Python 2.3 debate at PyCon or somewhere else. Um, or I guess you could just come up and shame me uh, for the mic. But uh, um, they could, the, the Python developers will be supporting Python 2.7 through um, 2020. So we got a couple years left here. Um, like Red Hat 7 will support uh, 2.7 through 2024. So, you know, there's a couple of years left on that, you know, as, as well, but that's, you know, de declining. And th there's a lot of effort now, uh, especially on the client side, but it, it's building on the server side that people, you know, want to get on Python 3, uh, want to get on newer technologies and use a lot of the newer stuff that's out there. Um, so that's, that's my spot in this. So I'm Jim Baker. Um, I'm a core developer of Jython. We just released Jython 2.7, so apparently we're supporting the dead Python. <laughs> um, it's okay. <laughs> but regardless, um, yeah, it took some time for us to go and um, come to this level of compatibility. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that if you look at the under, underpinnings of, say, 2.7, um, which you need to implement a truly compatible implementation, uh, it's very similar to what you also need for, say, Python 3.2. So we've already made some progress along those lines. And I think that that uh, hopefully means that we would be able to go and rapidly get to the living version of Python, as opposed to the one that is, um, again, um, preserved. Um, so I am also a uh, software developer at Rackspace. I've been involved in uh, one particular project, which was to go and run Keystone 
on top of Jython, which we were able to successfully do without patching Keystone itself. Um, so that was an interesting sort of, um, uh, we were able to go and show that it was performant um, and um, you know, met the performance tests, all the other testing that we were doing on it. Um, and the other thing, um, excuse me, I'm a little bit sick, so hopefully I can get all the things I want to say about this out. Um, the other thing about uh, that uh, experience was is that we were able to run um, Keystone directly inside a standard um, application container. So this means that if you were an organization... Not Docker? Uh, no, not like Docker. Sorry, I'm thinking on the Java side. Yeah, Thanks for that. I'm just giving you uh, time. Absolutely, and that's how we're going to enliven this conversation. Um, <laughs> So think about something like you know running. If you are an organization that's already running Jetty or Tomcat, um, application containers that you already know how to deploy, um, or potentially you've I've talked to um, one or the other organization and they are in fact have done a port of Keystone to Java, so that they could go and rely on existing Java infrastructure and Java integration that they have with their existing identity service. So you might be able to go and take advantage of something like that with that sort of work. So that's an interesting uh, side, uh, or an interesting way that you could uh, deploy, again, a major OpenStack component. Are there other OpenStack components like this? The answer is maybe. Certainly if you look at the major ones, like you, know, you think of Nova, for example. Nova currently uses technology eventlets, which a lot of people question is whether that was a really good thing to do or not, that um, on the face of it is going to be difficult to run on something like Jython, just because of the stack switching support that eventlets actually use. Is it feasible to still do that? Yes, because you can always map a greenlet to an actual native thread. Um, and when you're running on something like Java, running hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of threads is not a problem. One interesting additional uh, thing I would add to talking about something like Jython is a lot of people complain about the global interpreter lock, the inability to run computational threads, the fact that if you do have some computation that is occurring um, in a request in some other part of your process, maybe with the event lit, maybe a thread that is waiting on something, you can see because of the way that scheduling works with the global interpreter lock, massive um, reductions in terms, or massive increases in your response time, and massive reduction in your throughput, okay? Just by the fact that you're no longer running just very short uh, requests and responses. Um, so this allows you, so the interesting thing is that Java doesn't have this limitation. Okay, because it doesn't have a global interpreter lock. Instead, it allows you to freely use threads, and Jython simply just builds on that. We don't do anything special, we just don't get in the way of that. So, from all, these, from all of your perspectives, it sounds like a lot of the reason, reasons why you are looking at these alternatives are for either compatibility sometimes, or straight for for performance, and there's, and there's a mixture of these reasons across all three. Um, now, what is the biggest downside of, you know, we, we, if we were to wave a magic wand and all of a sudden one or more services, we can't imagine all of them would Im immediately move, but one or more services are implemented in your language of choice. What's going to be the downside? What's the problem? Um, I think at this point, um, Go is still pretty new, um, so if they decide to change anything major about the language itself, um, that's going to affect us. Python is very mature at this point, and um, aside from porting to three, um, you know, uh, it's just a it's something we're going to have to deal with. Um, you were talking about an interesting uh, an interesting problem with the Whiskey stack and and re. Yeah, well, that. Can and you that, talk about that? Yeah, that's something I know. I know, like the the files team is really uh, they're really excited about getting that part of what we implement and go to the community to help us figure that out. But 
you know, the, so, the WSGI pipeline in Swift, you, you, you can configure your pipeline, restart Swift, and you, got, you have new options in there. And so we, we, you know, doing it compiled is a little. Yeah. Just a level set. Are people familiar with WSGI and how it, how it is used in Swift? Crickets. Yes and no. So there is, there is a specification in Python for passing information through a series of, of cooperating processes. This is the WSGI pipeline. And different pieces of Swift are implemented as, quote, middleware in this pipeline. Uh, it is really easy to add and subtract different services simply by editing the, the config file and allowing different pieces to interact with this stream of processing as it goes down and it comes back up. But with Go, there is no, there is no swapping of things in and out. It is one big binary. Yeah, it'd definitely be a challenge to figure that out. Um, you know, like at Rackspace, we, we may not use certain pieces of the Swift middleware, WSGI middleware, which essentially just wraps the main Swift piece in those. So we have like our own uh, middleware we call uh, RackAuth to do all of our authentication, uh, identity uh, authentication. Um, we have some stuff for usage and things like that that we turn on, but now when we do that in Go, how's that gonna work? Um, we started with the object server, which is probably, like, like I said, the most the simplest part because there is no middleware on the object server. I don't think that's true, but there's very little middleware on the object server. Uh, so on my side, so if you were to build something new in Python 3, there are effectively no downsides. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> Everything is great with me. Yeah. Um, there, just but, use but, Python 3. It's still, simple. There's course, still a gill, though, right? There's still a gill. Okay. Uh, there, okay. there are downsides. But <laughs> Python 3 plus no gill <laughs> means awesomeness, but regardless. But there are uh, anything you would do in, in, if you're going to build something today in Python 2, as most of the people are doing, to, to do it in Python 3, um, you know, for, for a long time, the, uh, the issue with like, dependencies, people had a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of things are imported. But if you now look, at within anything that was released in the last year, something like 65 or 70 percent of, of uh, packages that are up on, on PyPI have Python 3 support. Anything that's been anything that's been released at all since Python 3 came out is actually pretty high. Uh, so a lot of the things where, where, where people say uh, you know there's oh there's no dependencies I can't depend on all this stuff is a lot of misinformation. People still think to this day Matplotlib, SciPy, and um, NumPy don't support Python 3. All three of those supported it by 3.2. So uh, the, the ability to write software in Python 3 is actually a, a lot more easy than people believe. So um, it, it's something that's out there. There are obviously, you know, if you have other needs, Go or, or, or Jython or other things could, could certainly be there. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of possibilities with Python 3 that people just don't realize. So um, it's anything you would do in 2, you could do in 3. But I, go ahead. I, I think that's absolutely true. But, uh, OpenStack has had the unique challenge of it, which only recently is. Yep. So we're all very excited. And so, yep. And so, like, uh, Victor's worked on that, worked on a bunch of other things. Uh, also, with, like, in 3.4, you have um, the async IO library, and there's a, a, a port to 2 called uh, Trollius. And so, you know, looking forward, there's a lot of, a, a lot of possibility with 3 that anything, you, like, I wouldn't tell someone to start a project today, and I haven't done this for years, tell someone to start a project today on 2. Um, there's, you know, Python 3 is, is, has been basically production ready since 3.3. 3.4 uh, 3 is already out, 3.5 is in alpha 4 right now. Um, so the, the community, the development community is behind it. Um, you know, th th like I said, the dependency stuff is, is dwindling. And, um, and right now it's, it's something I would like to see more of. And, and especially, you know, I guess the, there is one downside certainly if you were going to, um, get involved in this, you could potentially go down a rabbit hole of some things that are not ported. And so one of the things that has held back some of the, the Python 3 efforts uh, in OpenStack is that there's, I think it was a MySQL driver um, was unported and was dead and there was no maintainer. So sometimes you run into those issues. And that's certainly uh, putting effort behind porting libraries that are not core to your service, or even if they are core to your service, they're not your, your sweet spot. Um, I don't think anyone here wants to, you know, spend their workday porting a MySQL driver when your job is to be a, a cloud files developer or something like that. Um, it's not in the business uh, best interest to spend uh, that effort a lot of the time. Um, it's something you could sometimes get engineering effort behind, um, but 
the fact that the community has not picked up all those all those pieces is certainly a uh, you know a downside to exploring some of this. But it is getting a lot better. The the, the situation is much better than it was even a year ago, uh, two years ago for sure. So, so one downside that is um, definitely you notice immediately with Jython is current lack of the Python C extension API support. So this is a major uh, downside. There's no question about it. I will say, however, that um, uh, we have a Google Summer of Code project um, that I'm mentoring this summer, and we have someone who's working on to address this very specific problem and has made significant progress already in terms of adapting the C memory model that you see in CPython and having that comply with what would need to uh, do with working with Jython and Java um, more generally. Um, the upside of something like that, uh, the upside though is that you do get all of Java. So you were just mentioning database drivers. Um, JDBC of course is a standard. Uh, Spring Data is less of a standard but still has significant support. Uh, so if you want to go and interface with Cassandra, there is a Spring Data uh, driver for that. Um, so. We get some stuff taken away. We also get some stuff um, added back. And I also wanted to just mention that one interesting project I've been working on is supporting PEP 33, 33 WSGI middleware, or WSGI, which includes WSGI middleware. And the ability to go and intermix, say, servlet filters with um, standard Python middleware is definitely very doable. Um, and in particular, we're interested in doing this with a Java-based um, uh, uh, project called Repose that we use at Rackspace, being able to write Python-based middleware, enabling our Python teams to write their own middleware and stick it into that, not have it to just be front-ended, but interleaved in any arbitrary stack that they want. It's interesting. Um, what can we do with that? I don't know. I'm, I'm just an enabler. All right, You go and figure out, um, you know, to a certain extent, what you want to do with that. So let me push back on this a little bit. The, one of the things that I'm hearing, except for in, in Brian with Python 3, is we're doing this for performance, perhaps with threads or perhaps with Go. There's, there isn't there a well-worn path toward performance in Python? You write it in Python. You profile it. You find your hotspot. You drop down to C or Rust or D or something. Surprisingly, not Go, because Go doesn't work with anything else. And then you put your hotspot in, in a lower level language, and then you keep everything else still, still managed and scripted with Python. Isn't that how you drive performance? For example, NumPy has different places where they call out, and they do very intensive disk I.O. In, uh, in C, and they don't really care about the GIL, because they release the GIL for their own internal processing. Why isn't that the way forward? Or for some, other, for some other types of services, can't we just run it on PyPy? Pi Pi? Yeah, if you want like a 30% improvement, but if you want like a 400% improvement, you go with, you go with Go. The <laughs> PyPy has, Pi Pi has roughly the same order of magnitude impro Im improvement for a lot of workloads, you know, five to seven times. Wouldn't it be easier to just make sure that you can run it with, with PyPy? Um, actually, Alex tried that. Uh, Ux Gainer, I think he was one of the major contributors to PyPy. I actually tried uh, redoing Swift in PyPy and didn't really. You didn't really do anything. You just fixed a couple of bugs yeah. and fixed some bugs in PyPy along the process. It yep. was a great effort. But it wasn't like a killer, you know, performance improvement for Swift. So. And now that Alex, uh, he was on my team and he has, has now left Rackspace, but uh, it was great to have, you know, a, a PyPy core dev uh, able to, you know, Look at, at that stuff and look at other projects and kind of get the um, you know, the ball rolling in terms of everything running on PyPy. Uh, I don't know that anyone has ever has ever deployed anything on PyPy, but it you know runs the unit tests are run. It's still on the gate. Uh, up until about a week ago, I think it was when there were a couple uh, bugs that came through and um, the PyPy is kind of at risk now, or maybe it's already happened of being removed from the gate. Um, because there is no one, no, no champion to step forward and, and maintain PyPy. So if anyone actually does want PyPy, um, step up. Uh, and, and you might have to, to, to lend your hand uh, towards making it run, because that's um, 
kind of just a ghost right now. No one's really looking after it. And the fact that it took a lot of projects down, um, it was moved to being non-voting, and I don't even know if it's still in there. I haven't looked at my Garrett in a couple of days, but um, it's people wanted it at first. Uh, there was a, you know a start toward the effort, and then no, nothing really picked up, and now it's potentially going away. So, um, oh, maybe PyPy isn't it. But what about again this traditional method of drop the little performance critical piece down into C or into Java? It turns out that I think that. Um, if you're going to compare writing your code in C versus Java, I don't know about you, but I certainly prefer writing that in Java where I have. So we have a, we have a fan. We have a Java fan. We have at least one Java fan besides myself, yes. There's two, OK, a few more. There's 6,000 right. other people here, though. Keep in mind. So we don't know. Um, I, I do think that we've, we have seen that it is easier to write correct code um, that doesn't you know, seg fault. Um, in Java um, than it is in C or and especially C++. So what about Cython? Cython I think is dead easy. I think Cython is a great choice. And you know, the thing is, is that um, you know, being able to go and have this, taking advantage of the C extension API, uh, compiling it down to C, and having that be relatively transparent to, yes, you have to go and mark up your code appropriately but it still does most of that work for you. So Cython is a great choice. There's no question about it. Um, and so I, I'm actually a favor, although I'm, I'm going to definitely be an advocate for what Jython can do. Um, I also believe in these other languages. Uh, I really like Go for you know, the sort of stuff you're doing where it's really IO bound. I think it's classic case of, um, of doing things. And you see that um, work so well also with etcd, another great example. I think that for more computationally bound type things, we might see that something, you know, a language like Java, which is started, to, you know, really has that uh, ability to go and demonstrate that power in the big data space, clearly demonstrated. Right? We see that with Spark and Hadoop, and these are things that we're going to be presumably incorporating more and more into what we do and how we run OpenStack. Um, the ability to go and use something like Monasca, for example, to go and really understand what's going on in your environment comes to mind. And they're using Storm and uh, thresholding as built, written in Java. Maybe it could be written in Python. Um, but right now, it, it's written in Java. It runs as a Storm Bolt, very efficient, um, very capable in terms of being able to go and produce derived analytics. So, so maybe we don't, you know, we may not be in this position where we're going to be rewriting um, large chunks of OpenStack into these other languages. Because hey, the Python stuff works, and maybe Python is fantastic, especially for integration. But um, I definitely think that, again, we, we want to go and open it up. The, the language is a tool, right? I mean, Absolutely. I think, I think Traditionally, we get into this, mm -hmm. this uh, religious war with, with programming languages, and the fact is that they're a tool. You know, uh, you know, a wrench is a good tool to do a specific job. A screwdriver mm -hmm. is a tool to do a specific job. Crescent wrench is kind of like, you know, I could use this as a hammer or I could wrench something. It's not exactly right, right. what that's for, but we can do that. And so I think all these languages that we're using, mm -hmm. you know, they're just tools, and some of them do the, the job better than others. Right. That's nothing against Java, it's nothing against Python, it's nothing against Go or C. Sometimes it's easier to build these things in certain languages that do these things better. So let's open it up for questions. If you've got a question, could you please come to the, uh, to the microphone? It's on. It should be on. Is it on? Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, I, yes, you're right. Language is a tool. But I think especially with programming languages, it's not just the language. It's always the ecosystem and infrastructure around it. I mean, um, I'm not a big fan of the Java infrastructure. It's phenomenally complex. I never can get a handle of it. But I have experimented with, with Jython, and I'm, I'm really impressed that it Thank works. You. Well, um, so if we introduce other languages here, and I think we, we talked about this supporting the stack for DevOps, but it's also more. It's also developers now suddenly having to look. It's not just you can 
learn programming language in a, in a weekend like you used to 30 years ago, 20 years ago or so. But these days, it's, you have to have all the infrastructure knowledge, otherwise you just won't be an efficient developer in that language. Right? So it would be nice to say, yes, language is just another tool, but there's so much that comes with it, right? There's definitely those communities that are built up around those languages. Yeah, right? and, and, and a certain way of thinking and doing things and all these tools. So that, that, that's one thing. I just, But my actual question was, um, you, you have used Go. Have you tried the same thing with, with Jython? Uh, no. Would, would, <laughs> would you, would, would you, what would you think would happen? Uh, no idea. Uh, my, my team probably is not going to want to write um, any Java code. I mean, no, once that, again, we get the religious the war. You, you don't have to right? write Java code. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, I, I don't, well, and then we don't, so one of the advantages of like Go is we can just drop a binary around. We don't have to throw together some Java, you know, we don't have to put a, a whole Java infrastructure out there, right? Um, so Rackspace, we have a, a piece of um, software called Repose that does a lot of our uh, authentication stuff. It does some rate limiting, things like that. Um, cloud files, we don't use Repose because we don't want to have to deploy some of that infrastructure as well. So we're managing just the Python stuff and not Java and Python. So a lot uh, for us too, it's also operational. Um, with Go, we can build it and then just drop it on there, turn off the Python stuff, turn on the Go stuff, and it's good to go. It's no pun intended. Doesn't, doesn't that, what about patching though, or replacing? Isn't is that more or less difficult? Yeah, it's, you, know, you can't patch the binary. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll respond a little bit well, to this. One, one quick question and then, and okay. then this gentleman. Or one, one quick response and then this gentleman. For me, okay. Yes. All right, so, um, yeah, so I think the thing is, is that I don't think that, um, you know, what you were building is a real good target for Jython, per se. Um, I do think it could be a good target for using something like Net. No question about it. And would you be able to exceed the performance that you see with Go? Quite likely. Um, that's so. I would I would I would say if you're doing something low level like what you're doing, go with something that's equally low level and also has all this additional engineering that has gone with it. And Netty definitely has that. Um, so with everything split into a zillion components, performance profiling is already difficult enough in OpenStack and it's all the same language. Um, how do you see that proceeding if we start writing in different languages and a complex user-facing process has a performance issue? Uh, how much of a living hell is my life going to become? What, yes. is your, what, is your, <laughs> what is your performance like? How do you collect your stats like on your clusters and whatnot? I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm not s talking so much about like live necessarily detecting problems in production. I'm a developer, so I'm more interested in uh, code profiling. So in that case, there are, you know, there are well-known processes in Python, but because everything is split into, you know, spawning an instance with a volume attached is going to involve like 87 different demons or something. Yeah. And so now I have to profile each of them, which is a giant pain in the butt, but I do it all in Python at least. Yeah. So that's the process that I'm concerned mm -hmm. about. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I wish some of my team actually came and like to talk about how they're actually doing the profiling and performance stuff and go. But they, I mean, they we have a dev cluster we have set up and and they can just you know assault the thing and and do it both with Python and then switch to Go and get some numbers. But but I think that this is a real serious concern because mm -hmm. I know that you know I've one of my hobbies is doing uh, natural language processing. There's a lot of stuff in Java, but every once in a while I'll see a, a library in Java and I'm like. I really want to go there because the rest of my stack is in Python. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is not because the software isn't good. It's simply that there is a mental shift associated with switching from one environment to the other. And I swear I can sometimes feel the hamster start running when I need to spin something up. I mean, isn't that a real issue? Yeah, we should talk about this afterwards and see how we can get you uh, better using that Java environment. But um, so. <laughs> You know, I, 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 I didn't come here to just convert everyone here to say, hey, Java is great. Let's go use it tomorrow and all that. If you are using Java or there are resources that, that are out there that could benefit you, that's um, something where, again, Jython could really help. It's the same language, right? It's Python. But you have access to, you know, someone was, the, the questioner was asking about monitoring and logging and things like that. 
well, there are well-defined standards around how that is done in Java. And actually, that is why operationally it can be easier, I think, to make these sorts of considerations. It may not, may not be easier right now because of where we are. And maybe Python will be, you know, the way that we deploy Python is going to be very entrenched in organizations. But regardless, JMX is there. Standard logging uh, support is there. That's what you could potentially use. So what I'm hearing, just to summarize, is that the cost is real, mm -hmm. but you just have to learn. The, the answer would be learn Python and Go. Learn mm -hmm. Python and Java. Mm -hmm. Use whatever the standard is, which means I think that the concern is real. You would have to make sure you uh, basically learn the ecosystems on both sides. And, and then also get involved in those communities. I think like one of the reasons why the guys went with Go is because the community is really good and they will help you. Yeah. Um, hi. So I, have, uh, I work on the infra team. And my question is kind of twofold. Number one is, who is going to support all the build and test infrastructure? Like, what, what does the tooling look like? And the second question I have is, um, have you guys spoken to the package maintainers that distribute OpenStack to see how your languages fit into the rules and regulations and policies that they have in place for rolling things for, say, APT or, or uh, RPMs and stuff like that? So I'll take a, a stab at that one to start. <laughs> and I think the answer is both of those questions are good questions that have not been resolved yet. This is not intended to be a, uh, a yes, we should charge headlong into in, in any one of these directions. But given the fact that there is an opportunity to, to advance, it, it possibly advance OpenStack in some way through the use of some of these tools, should we consider changing the way in which we do infra, changing the way in which some we do packaging in order to take advantage of some of these tools? I don't think it's a, uh, I think that we need to decide whether the pain and the difficulty and the packaging and all those other things that go with it are worth, uh, are ultimately worth the gains that would also come with any one of these things. To just follow that up, um, I'm actually leading the modern JavaScript session at 2 o'clock, and Go in particular, being a compile time linked language, is something that I care a lot about because the distros hate that. They really hate that, and JavaScript is in a similar world. So if you guys have any kind of comments, have had conversations about how that could work, I would love to know it. But we can talk after the session. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, our, you know, our team, we, we deploy to tens of thousands of servers, so they're not going to want to like be doing this in some kind of goofy fashion. We, we use packaging extensively. So um, yeah, that's, that's going to be an important aspect of this whole thing. Up, Clay. So the question's been staring at us there on the board the whole time we've been sitting in here. Is it time for more than just Python and OpenStack? Do, do, I mean, you guys have presented some use cases, but I don't feel like we've answered any of the concerns uh, as to what are the risks, how is the infrastructure going to handle the burden and, and packaging. I think this is a, this is a great question. Uh, how will we ever be able to begin to quantify that risk against, uh, you know, how will we quantify some of that value? And when will we be able to make a decision of it is now time for something that's not Python in OpenStack? I think, uh, I mean, great question. I think we are ready. Um, I think some of the stuff that the guys have done for Swift has shown that um, we can do some powerful stuff in another language. I haven't yet been able to validate those benchmarks, uh, Scott. So I'm really looking forward to you presenting more on those because we're not seeing exactly what you guys have seen. And okay. we have tried to compare it to, to PyPy and CPython and uh, async I.O. Uh, so I think that um, it is going to be really exciting. But we're going to have to get that out into the community and have people be able to replicate that. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, the feature branch is out there uh, for, the, for the Hummingbird stuff on uh, its feature branch of Swift. Like I said, we've uh, implemented the object server and the, uh, and the replicator. So All right. check it out. So it's, it's about time for us to, to finish up. I think that just to, to finish with Clay's question, the answer to this question is not known. But we believe that we brought these people here because they have, for one reason or another, made the decision to use some sort of alternate in a restricted setting. Their answer was, at least sometimes, yes. So we thought it was a good idea to bring this to the larger community and start the discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.